Welcome. Uh, I'm Steve Latham. I'm the director of Yale's Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics, as I think probably every one of you already knows. Uh, but it is uh, thankful, I, I'm thankful that I have such a small role. All I have to do is say, <laughs> welcome. We're very glad you're here. We are very glad that um, Al Johnson is back here, having once been a visiting professor at the Bioethics Center a few years ago, and being a Yale alum, as he was reminding me just before uh, we sat down. Um, and we are very, very glad to be able to have this first lecture in honor of Chef Newland. Good. Glad you could all come. I turn it over to Mark. Well, on this occasion of the first annual Sherwin B. Newland lecture, sponsored by Yale's Interdisciplinary Bioethics Center, I'm delighted and privileged to introduce to you, or at least speak about, both Dr. Sherwin Newland, at our honoree, and Professor Albert Johnson, this year's Newland Lecture. First then, about Chef. Those of you who know Dr. Newland know that we have many reasons to celebrate his life and his work. There's no doubt that he has stood for many, many years among the very best of surgeons around the world, the very best of those who teach surgical medicine, <coughs> the very best of those who articulate in both the written and spoken word the concerns, questions, insights, and best practices of surgery. And since the early 1990s, he has stood among the very best writers whose what I think of as renaissance interests, mm -hmm. human interests, stretch from the issues of life and death, embodiment and consciousness, illness and health, to the stories and biographies of multiple figures in both medicine and philosophy, a powerful autobiographical exploration of the relationship between father and son, and issues in multiple disciplines of not only medicine and science, but history, literature, philosophy, and even religion. Who among us can forget such word, works as How We Die, or The Wisdom of the Body, which interestingly, when it was republished as a paperback, now has the title How We Live, <laughs> or Maimonides, and Lost in America, and many, many others. Raised in the Bronx, Shep did his undergraduate work at New York University, and his MD at Yale University. Since then, he has spent the rest of his professional life, basically, at Yale University as clinical professor of surgery, but also as fellow of the institution, the Institute of Social and Policy Studies, the Whitney Humanities Center, Bradford College, and so on. He was a founding member of the Bioethics Committee at Yale New Haven Hospital, and a founding member of the Yale Bioethics Center. He continues as a consultant and wise teacher throughout the university, and as an active member of the executive committee of the Bioethics Center. Beyond Yale, his work with the Hastings Center and many other related institutions continues apace. And these constitute only a kind of tip of the iceberg description of his many activities and ongoing professional relationships. Shep has been honored before, of course, by the American Cancer Society, the Book Critics Circle, with four McGovern Medals, the alumni, other Alumni Achievement Awards, honorary degrees, the Best American Science Writing Award, the Jonathan Rhodes Gold Medal of the American Philosophical Society, and more. This afternoon, though, we think this honoring of Shep is special because here we celebrate Shep truly as family, surrounded by colleagues, friends, personal family, co-workers of all kinds, and those who claim him as mentor and companion 
a life's professional and personal journey. Shep's circle of such friends and colleagues extends, of course, to all those who have profited by his medical care, but also his countless books for medical readers and multiple books for general readers is hundreds and hundreds of articles, op-ed pieces, substantive book reviews, and writings in almost every genre that I can think of, except perhaps poetry. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, he may have written some poetry, for all I know. Whether or not he has written poetry that I have seen, he writes elegantly and, I must say, poetically, again and again. Who can forget such lines, but I'm paraphrasing here. I looked for freedom, but found understanding. Mm. Or, if there is wisdom in the body, and if the body evokes wonder and awe, then the consciousness of the body is not far from the embodiment of consciousness. Shep, our word to you, and with Sarah Peterson, our word this afternoon is a word of honor and of gratitude, simply but wholeheartedly put. Thank you. turn to the lecture, which constitutes a great part of our honoring of Chef this afternoon. So the first, you, you, you all know that our lecturer today is Professor Albert Johnson. And the first thing I want to say to Professor Johnson himself and to his wife, Liz, welcome back. <laughs> Al was, in fact, the Yale Bioethics Center's very first visiting bioethicist in residence. And I must say, an illustrious first in a long line of illustrious followers. His presence here back then among us gave energy and life and I might say a sense of the future of the developing strengths and possibilities of this enterprise. Before he came to the Bioethics Center for a year in residence, we knew Al Johnson well as an ethicist, a bioethicist, and author. We knew him also as one of the founding scholars of bioethics as a discipline. His 1998 book entitled The Birth of Bioethics was a stunning contribution to the understanding of bioethics, both historically and as it existed then. This book was followed by his publication of A Short History of Medical Ethics, which complemented the bioethics book and helped to clarify the relationship between these disciplines. Al was the obvious choice for our bioethics center at that time, and he is an obvious choice for this evening's celebration of the center and of Chef Newland. Professor Johnson received his doctorate in religious studies with a specialization in ethics from Yale University. He had been previously educated at Santa Clara University and Gonzaga University. He began his teaching career at Loyola University of Los Angeles and then moved to the University of San Francisco where he served as president for six years. Because of his work in bioethics, L. Johnson was appointed in 1972 Professor of Ethics in Medicine in the School of Medicine, University of California, San Francisco, where he established pioneering courses of consultation on ethical issues in medicine. In 1987, he became chair of the Department of Medical History and Ethics at the School of Medicine at the University of Washington and remained there until he retired, just before he came back to Yale. <laughs> he is currently Senior Ethics Scholar in Residence in the Program in Medicine and Human Values 
at the California Pacific Medical Center, San Francisco. He presently also teaches at the Fromm Institute for Lifelong Learning at the University of San Francisco. There are many, many things that Al Johnson have done that are pertinent to what we're doing here uh, this afternoon, but just a couple or uh, two or three of them. He was appointed to the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects in Biomedical and Behavioral Research, first established by Congress in 1974. And he served on the succeeding Presidential Commission on the Study of Ethics in Medicine. <coughs> He's a fellow of the Hastings Center. He served on the American Board of Medical Specialties, the National Board of Medical Examiners, and the National Board for Foreign Medical Graduates. In 1981, he was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and served twice on its council. In addition to the two books I mentioned already on bioethics and on medical ethics, Al Johnson is the author of a popular book entitled Bioethics Beyond the Headlines. He's also the author or co-author of a book entitled Clinical Ethics, a widely used text on ethics consultation, now in its sixth edition and published in six languages. He's also co-authored with Stephen Tuleman an extremely important philosophical and ethical volume entitled The Abuse of Casuistry. He's the recipient of many awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award for the American Association of Bioethics and Humanities. Professor Johnson will speak with us this evening on the intriguing topic, Humanities are the Hormones, from Osler to Newland. Please welcome Professor Johnson. Professor Farley, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. It is uh, my great honor <coughs> to honor my good friend, Shep Newland, and uh, to inaugurate the Sherwin Newland Lecture Series. As professor of surgery at Yale for many years, Shep can look back at an illustrious predecessor, neurosurgeon Harvey Cushing, a Yale undergraduate who returned after many years at the other place <laughs> and bequeathed his library and unexpectedly his surgical specimens to his alma mater. Cushing, like Newland, was not only a skilled surgeon, but a literary man. His biography of his mentor and friend, Sir William Osler, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1926. I choose to go from the Yale connections between Sherwin Newland and Harvey Cushing as surgeons and as writers to reach Sir William himself for the theme of my remarks. Dr. Osler, former chairman of medicine at Johns Hopkins and then Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford, was elected president of the British Classical Association. His inaugural lecture, delivered on Friday, May 16, 1919, was titled, The Old Humanities and the New Science. In that lecture, he said, I quote, man's body is a humming hive of working cells, each with its specific function all under the control of the brain and heart and all dependent on materials called hormones which lubricate the wheels of life. Remove a man's thyroid gland that secretes thyroxin and you deprive him of the lubricants which enable his thought engines to work. <laughs> Gradually the stored acquisitions of his mind cease to be available, and within a year, he sinks into dementia. And then Sir William goes on to conclude with the phrase which is my title, 
Humanities are the hormones of the mind. Humanities are the hormones of the mind. Sir William wrote those words only a few years after the chemical functions called hormones were identified. Ernest Starling, who had insul uh, isolated secretin, introduced the word hormone in his Croonian lecture of 1905 at the suggestion of a classicist friend who pointed out that the Greek hormeo means stimulate or excite. Sir William remarks to his classicist audience, you will recognize from its derivation how appropriate the term is. Seven years before Osler's lecture, his close friend and later biographer Harvey Cushing had reported the hormonal irregularities of the anterior pituitary gland, which were involved in a range of metabolic and physical conditions, the most sensational of which was, at the time, acromegalic gigantism. This report heralded Cushing's innovative brain surgery and marked an historical moment in recognizing the powerful effects of endocrine and exocrine hormones in health and disease. Osler must have rejoiced in his friend's discovery. When Sir William uttered that marvelous metaphor, humanities are the hormones, he illustrated it by another early discovery of nascent endocrinology, the devastation of myxedema due to a hormonal deficit of the thyroid gland. Skin becomes dry and scaly, facial edema appears, voice becomes <coughs> hoarse, heart goes into congestive failure, and eventually <coughs> mental changes such as confusion, dementia, depression, and paranoia appear. Osler marveled that the absence of a minute amount of secretion from a gland in the neck would desiccate the body and eventually reach, quote, the thought engines. He begins then to draw his theme for his audience of classical humanists. That audience was well aware of the shift of university studies from the classics into the physical and biological sciences. These were the earliest days which uh, C.P. Snow later called the two cultures. Osler himself is bringing that new science to the study of medicine at Oxford, the historical hub of the humanities. Osler tells his listeners that just as these chemical messengers, the hormones, target receptors at different and distant sites, so must classical knowledge, with its insights into humanity, history, and nature, reach into and enliven the minds of young scientists whose intelligence is being broken into limited, fragmented specialization. He says, quote, applying themselves to research, young men get into backwaters far from the mainstream. They quickly lose the sense of proportion, become hypercritical, and the smaller the field, the greater the tendency to megalocephaly. <laughs> Unfortunately, Sir William does not take his metaphor much further. So allow me the privilege of pushing his metaphor onward. I will propose that the disappearance of the humanities from medical training and medical thinking causes a dismaying mixedema of the mind and spirit of medicine and of many of its practitioners. The same could be said of much of higher education, business, engineering, computer sciences, much that goes on in all these new buildings up this hill. <laughs> but I will, in tribute to our honoree this evening, 
speak primarily of its effect upon medicine. I will propose that the disappearance of humanities from the medical and pre-medical education deprives the medical practitioner of two crucial constituents of the work of curing and the work of caring. Namely, an appreciation of tragedy and a sense of exuberance. The humanities range wide from music to history, philosophy, painting, but their heart is the great literature of our civilization. And in my opinion, at the heart of that humanistic literature are the tragedies created by Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, down to Strindberg, Ibsen, Miller, Beckett, and most vividly embodied in Shakespeare's Hamlet, Lear, and Othello. The essence of tragedy is the illusion of human control over human life. All great tragic drama compels us to believe that fate, not human power, writes the history of each human person and of human history itself. All tragedy is pervaded with a sense of uncertainty. Will power fall before fate? Will courage be crushed by rage? Will the best laid plans be undone and highest expectations be disappointed? Every reflective practitioner of medicine knows how thoroughly uncertainty permeates their work. The first aphorism of Hippocrates was praised for many centuries as the very epitome of medicine. It is scarcely known today. It reads, quote, life is short, the art is long, opportunity fleeting, Experiment perilous, judgment difficult. <coughs> Ancient commentators, from Galen to Rabelais, who was, by the way, a physician as well as a satirist, interpreted these enigmatic words in a variety of ways, and there are as many interpretations as there are interpreters, although in general, <coughs> scholars, ancient and modern, agree that the words reflect upon the intrinsic uncertainty of diagnosis and treatment, the changing course of disease, and the risk of error, and the great responsibility laid upon those who engage in the practice of medicine. Sir William Osler encapsulated the aphorism in the sentence, quote, medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. Sherwin Newland collapsed this sentence into the title of his own autobiography, The Uncertain Art, Thoughts on a Life in Medicine. Each patient is unique, each problem is new, each maneuver is risky, no formula or algorithm captures the reality of the case. In contrast, modern science and the medicine that comes out of it fosters the idea of human control, mastery of the movements of the physical world by systematic investigation and transfer of knowledge gained into specific maneuvers. Those who learn the science of modern medicine and practice it must absorb this sense of control. Every move of mind and hand must be ruled by premises and axioms and proceed rigorously through the data presented by the body. Uncertainty present at every step must be banished as far as possible. Even the most sophisticated theories of clinical judgment, which appreciate the probabilistic waves around each tentative conclusion, are compelled to reduce those wave motions as much as possible. 
The modern physician must be sure of self and of science, convinced that the science will conquer disease. It would be foolish to think otherwise. The splendid collection of Harvey Cushing specimens, now exhibited glowingly in the Cushing Whitney Medical Library, reveal his slow, meticulous movement from the almost utter uncertainties surrounding efforts to enter the brain toward a precise neurosurgery. Our medicine and our science must perforce follow this move. Yet around this world of control and certainty, uncertainty lingers and tragedy lurks. <coughs> In the real world, treatments fail and death prevails. Dr. Newland's classic, How We Die, vividly chronicles this universal truth. He did not propose that physicians of our days become pessimists and doubters, nor do I. Who, after all, would seek help from a gloomy, indecisive doctor? <laughs> I only suggest that their scientific and therapeutic optimism can reach the receptors in their patients' minds and hearts when they aim at the same time when they deeply appreciate that the therapeutic aim may be beyond their power. Any genuine hope has meaning only as an acknowledgement of tragedy and uncertainty. Indeed, I believe that the only deep appreciation of this dark side can, to use Sir William's primitive endocrinology, lubricate the mind and heart of those who engage in the work of medicine, making them move in synchrony with the minds and hearts of those for whom they care. But wait, there is another facet of our humanistic tradition that cannot be ignored. I said above that the heart of that tradition lies in the classic tragic dramas. Its soul may lie elsewhere in the comic tradition that flows beside the tragic. Certainly we have taken that comic side more casually, and its authors, such as Aristophanes, Plautus, and Moliere, are less esteemed than the great tragedian, tragedians. Still, the greatest tragedian, Shakespeare, wrote an equal number of comedies, and the supreme humanistic achievement is called the Divine Comedy, opening in the tragedy of hell and concluding in the presence of the love that moves the sun and all the stars. Sir William Osler's analogy reflected on the deficits of the thyroid hormone. Dr. Cushing diagnosed a defect of the pituitary hormones. But it is not hormonal deficit and effect that best describes the hormones of the mind that are the humanities. It is the overall dominance of the hormonal system in living physiology, a chemical system of constant signaling, connecting, amplifying, and defending that which makes life live. Indeed, we find hormones at the source of the life force, preparing the body for fighting, fleeing, and mating, pushing the body into new phases of life, such as puberty and parenting, pulling it toward nutrition, and above all, balancing the internal environment of the entire organism. Tragedy and uncertainty are actually signs and symptoms of the defects and deficits of the hormones of the mind. The comic tradition, wearing the masks of Comus and Momus, does not merely tell jokes. It sings mirth, festivity, satire, and mockery, mainly of self. Above all, it prizes the smile evoked by the folly 
as well as the enjoyment of existence. The smile that can be erased only by the hormonal tides of depression flowing from the limbic system of a darkened brain. What should we call the flourishing function of these hormones? The cascade of giving and enhancing intellectual and emotional chemicals. Perhaps the word exuberance will serve. Its etymology is the Latin word uber, whose first meaning is breast, where the milk of life flows. But the word exuberance means abundance, overflowing, luxuriant, copious. The comedies of our humanistic tradition expose the exuberance of human living, sometimes hilarious, sometimes silly, sometimes sardonic, but when most profound, revealing the exuberance of the experience of being alive. The Jesuit poet Jerry Manley Hopkins wrote, there is the dearest freshness deep down thing. It is understandable that the pathophysiology of the hormone should catch the attention of Osler and Cushing. As medical men, they saw the damage being done and sought to repair it. But at the same time, that damage interrupts the exuberance of life, which must be revived. Its flourishing must be recognized by the healer as much as its failures must be diagnosed. So too must the healer acknowledge that it is the exuberance of life, not his own art, that heals. The hope that goes before a curative attempt and the rejoicing that follows its success manifests the exuberance of the comedy of life. The last chapter of Shep Newland's grimmest book, How We Die, is not about the loss of hope, but about its redefinition as an acknowledgement of the dignity of living. Also the moving tale of his life with his father, Stranger in America, ends not as a tale of tragedy, which it seemed to be throughout its pages, but in a moment of peace and reconciliation, one of those good endings that rounds out comedy where exuberance comes not throughout the story, but only in its closure. Several months ago, the Association of American Medical Colleges announced that the MCAT would be revised to test the candidate's knowledge of humanities. Now I praise uh, efforts to introduce medical students to literature but I doubt that an immersion in the humane letters will make much of a difference in the ways that physicians think and feel. It is, as C.P. Snow asserted, a matter of culture. We live in a culture in which technological and organizational prowess claims to overcome tragedy, although we see tragedy unfold around us every day. Medicine shares the belief that we can have the power to overcome it if we only expand our scientific understanding of its causes, if only we close the gaps of uncertainty in our firm conviction of the rational comprehensibility of existence. Reading books and taking courses will not close that gap. We must learn and observe those living persons whose spiritual genetics carry the spirit of the humanities and who express them in sense, sensibility, choice, and action. Sir William ended his lectures to the British Classical Association with reflections on the Great War just ended, in which he had suffered the personal tragedy of losing a beloved son a son who was cared for in a battlefield hospital by Harvey Cushing. He concludes with words not of tragedy, not even of uncertainty, 
but of certain exuberance. And I quote him, Let us not be discouraged. The direction of our vision is everything. And after weltering four years in chaos, poor stricken humanity still nurses an unconquerable hope. <clears throat> Witness of the power of ideals to captivate the mind. Unquote. It is the genius of the humanities to link tragedy and hope, uncertainty and certainty, and to encompass them all in a rounding of exuberance. This is the essence of great medicine. In his concluding lines, Osler quotes the maxim of Hippocrates, where there is love of the art, there is love of humanity. Those who love their practice of medicine must love humanity precisely in its tragic fragility and fearful uncertainty. The humanities consistently reveal to us that exuberance, love of humanity, can prevail amidst tragedy. And this is how medicine must be practiced by doctors and experienced by patients. Tonight, we honor Sherwin Newland for his sensitive, eloquent telling of this truth. Thank you. And if I can't answer them, I'll, I'll ask Jeff to help me. <laughs> yes. The one place where the humanities, once upon a time, entered medicine was with psychoanalysis. And uh, yet psychoanalysis seems to have given up Freud's deep knowledge of the classics in favor of psychotropic drugs or the materialization, let's say, of mental illness. Where do you see the place of psychoanalysis today in this whole story? I, uh, Dr. Sledge is I'll say, well, I'm right to come here. <laughs> I think he should answer that too. Yeah. Certainly, uh, it's an example of the transition that I was ta I've been talking about. In the beginnings of psychoanalysis, uh, the power of myth with all the great originators of psychoanalysis was at the very heart of that therapeutic endeavor, the way in which myth told secrets about the, the human condition and could be translated into various forms of therapeutic interactions. And now, of course, uh, it has moved to largely to uh, psychotherapeutic activities, no question about it. Um, I, I've, I've read somewhere that there's a, there's a little interest in the return to uh, the classical psychoanalysis, but I don't know much more about it than that. But it, it, I, I don't have an answer to your question except to say it's a very good illustration of what I'm talking about here. Um, when I first began to teach at the medical school at UCSF, one of our, our leading psychoanalysts there, um, a very vivacious and wonderful person, um, was overwhelmed by the onslaught of the, of the uh, use of drugs in the treatment and took his own life. Very, it, 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 in a sense, this took the meaning out of what he was doing as a therapist. And it was a tragedy that many of us felt at the time. Thank you for that question. William. Would you add anything to that, William? Please. <laughs> well, um, 
Yes, I, I, uh, I would like to add something to it. I mean, I think, first off, Al, what a wonderful talk. And, and, uh, and despite your efforts to educate me um, <laughs> on these issues uh, before, I felt like I learned something new tonight, and, uh, and, um, and I'm thankful. The um, psychoanalysis, I don't think, has given up the narrative. And uh, uh, psychiatry has uh, gone into a materialist uh, direction of, of an effort to be scientific and to understand things from a biological perspective and sometimes lost touch with the, with the narrative, the humanities, the story. And, uh, but I don't think that it, I think it will come back and I think it's coming back and it will uh, it will always be there whether it's explicitly taught and valued or not uh, uh, the, the fact is our patients are eminently human and, um, and they have to be talked to in one way or another <laughs> and, uh, it, and at some time or another uh, you have to reconcile uh, their story um, uh, with uh, the various conflicts that they experience and bring to the clinical encounter. So there's no getting away from it. Um, we have to all be humanists. We can't. We cannot abandon it. And, and I don't think any part of medicine can really abandon it. But certainly not uh, psychiatry, and not psychotherapy, or not efforts to to influence and to be influenced by uh, talk and listening. Is Oedipus and Antigone, and are they in this room? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Within the rubric of the humanities, we have music and philosophy, visual arts, theater, and many others. With respect to the tragedy and exuberance of life and medicine, do you make a, a strong distinction or perhaps even a hierarchy amongst these? No, I, I, I don't really. Uh, I think I'm talking more about the spirit of the thing uh, rather than particular instances. It's just that the, it's just that the, the vivid storytelling of the great tragic literature and of the great comic literature, it's the storytelling that kind of models much that goes on in the dealings of physician and patient and family. Each one is a story like that, and uh, so you can find you can find interesting um, in in every area of the arts. I, I I once wrote a little piece that I like very much, and uh, and I've never nobody's ever paid any attention to it. <laughs> trying to compare um, the uh, trying to explain how um, Velasquez's great painting of the dwarfs um, represents the whole of ethics. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess nobody else got it. <laughs> Las Meninas. Um, so I, I, I don't make a specific, I just choose that, probably because I know it better. If I knew music better, I suppose it would. It's interesting too how one of the things that, that uh, many, many physicians of, of the classical era, such as yes, you're not a musician, though. Heaven, no, I'm no. so <laughs> regretful of that. Yeah. But so many were. We're all musicians of the soul, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, musicians <laughs> of the soul. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and other question. I said, yes, Dr. Uh, I come from a base in endocrinology, so I think I do have to speak. Oh, for <laughs> was I okay? Oh, you were fine, except that what, for what, except with one thing, and that is that there's as much problem from a deficit of hormones as there is from an excess. Of hormones. Yeah. So yes. really, what you're, what, what you're, what you're preaching, is homeostasis. That is a balance, yes. yeah. or a balance between the humanities of mind and the science of the uh, of the uh, of, of endocrinology. Exactly. That's exactly right. Al? Yes. Uh, I'd like to elaborate on some of the things that Will Sledge said and respond a little bit more to Howard. As many people here know, my life was twice saved by psychoanalytic theory. 
plus a few dozen blasts of electricity. Mm -hmm. So I've seen it from both angles. Mm -hmm. I'm committed to psychoanalytic theory and about two years ago I undertook a study of how it is that neuroscience and psychoanalytic theory are coming closer together. And I discovered some fascinating things. Uh, I think we have, although not completely, to a large extent confirm the existence of the unconscious. Mm. I think we have begun to understand what the conscious mind is. I always remember Nobelist Gerald Edelman who used to or does refer to consciousness as the remembered presence. And thanks to the work on memory that has won another Nobel Prize, we know that hippocampus, part of the limbic system of which you spoke, converts short-term memories into long-term memories and we also know that long-term memories are distributed throughout the cortex but we don't know where. Mm -hmm. We also <coughs> know that any association will activate the hippocampus to bring those memories back to the hippocampus so they are expressed as conscious knowledge so when Gerald Edelman talks about consciousness as being the remembered presence, present, what he's actually saying is that this organic, anatomic, physiologic structure is the seat of our unconscious. So I think there's really no question of what will be happening over the next two or three decades and I perhaps William might comment on this, that as we go along and come to understand uh, the receptors and the transmitters and the hormones and the or physical changes, the synaptic physical changes more and more, we will again begin worshipping at our great icon, Sigmund Freud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think um, <coughs> that uh, neuroimaging and neuroscience today is a is a place where there will be a return to m what my conception of the humanities are. There'll be a return through them. It isn't as if we're coming and, and, and looking at neuroimages and, and say, well, I, I just read Antigone and that's what I see there. That's not what I... But when you, you look at that imagery and attempt to say, what is it telling us we're almost inevitably drawn into the same kinds of, of uh, mythic stories that that uh, that make up the great humanities. All right. More questions in here? Yes, sir. Uh, I loved your talk. I loved your illusions, but I must say I disagree with your assessment and your pessimism with regard. To the humanities in medicine. I Good. Think, mm -hmm. I, I, I believe, I, I, I worship at the altar of Osla, but I also believe that we have to be realistic of what it means to become a physician in a modern era. First of all, all of our young people have to learn a vocabulary of 35,000 words. <laughs> now, uh, they could be learning Greek or they could be learning Latin, but they are learning the language which allows them to participate in the richest humanitarian experience, which is entering the lives of their patients. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that there is an extraordinary passion that modern young people in medicine have to continue their immersion in, if they ever had it, in the humanities. Uh, Yale Medical School is remarkable in its choices of medical students, but I would say that I look at our students as fulfilling what you are painting as an idea, that these are individuals who are very, very fluent. They remain in touch, they write, they read, uh, our dean of the medical school has affixed uh, to the iPad that all of our students have classic works of literature. Yeah. They're reading Philip Keyes as an example of living with pain. 
they're reading a whole host of classic materials. Are they talented enough or versed enough to move over to this side of town to exchange words about deconstruction? No, that's not where they're at, and that's not where they should be. But I believe that there is a much greater balance than there ever was between the humanities and the science, and I think that we should follow it. I appreciate that very much. I think that uh, it's perhaps a little unfair to use Yale as an example. <laughs> 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 of, of medical education as a whole but I'm very glad to hear what you said just a, a, a quick comment about um, I think the an area that is underestimated about the power of humanities and medicine is the uh, critical thinking issue uh, critical thinking yes right. And the ability to see and analyze and to understand and grasp in a way that's not of the scientific method and to know truth in a different kind of way that's not in contrast to but is uh, a good friend of science truth. And they're not the same that you need to be trained to see and yeah. to hear. And Humanities trains people. It doesn't. It's it to see and hear and to uh, increase the sense of exuberance uh, in the process, but also uh, understand the presence of tragedy when it's there. There's nothing more tragic than not realizing tragedy is with you. Yeah. Well, when I was when I was the, a guest in in your college 13 years ago. And talked with students frequently. I I was deeply impressed by their quest for an understanding of how to think, how to think through a problem from beginning to end. Uh, in the years since that time, uh, I, while I've been consulting at a very large and prosperous hospital in San Francisco uh, that has a residency program, not university associated. Um, I've been discouraged <coughs> by what appears to me to be a, a disinterest mm -hmm. in medical residents there to really think about what it is to think. I mean, it, to, to sit in and, and, and do a case analysis with them and have the feeling that they don't know where to start and they don't know where the middle is and they don't know where the end is. I used to think it was a joke that Aristotle in his poetics said the most important thing is to know beginning, middle, and end. Because, I mean, isn't that obvious? <laughs> and it isn't. <laughs> well, Thanks, Al. It's a pleasure to hear you again. I've had this pleasure for so many years, and it's good to get a, another good dose of you. I want to say something about Freud of all things. Uh, he's been portrayed here as the arch-humanist and perhaps uh, anti-scientific. But one of his earliest works was to uh, do a study of the clinical pharmacology of cocaine. He was intimately familiar with this uh, mm -hmm. chemical. And his work on the clinical pharmacology of cocaine became a classic in the science of pharmacology. It uh, set the pattern. Perhaps what is the proper way to study the effects of a drug that persisted for many, many years? Mm -hmm. If I may make one other comment, I had the good fortune to uh, be at a meeting of uh, an organization where we heard from Yale medical students about the diversity of experience available to them as Yale medical students. Uh, they were selected as members of the uh, medical school council from the various years. <coughs> and I was just stunned by the amount of time these people have to do things that are so vastly different from... When I was a medical student, uh, 
not quite back in Osler's time. Uh, it was considered nearly unthinkable that you would spend two consecutive hours not paying attention to the main core uh, studies that would get you through the examinations and through national boards and all that stuff. We spent 60% of our first year in medical school learning gross anatomy. Uh, they don't spend nearly that. But now I hear from one of these young people that she spends 30 hours a week as a volunteer in a Fairhaven clinic. Mm -hmm. And the vast array of stuff they're doing in, in humanities, arts, etc. It's, it's quite a new generation that's coming along. I'm optimistic. I, I shouldn't speak again, but after all, it is my lecture, so <laughs> I get to do that. Uh, just, just to add to something that Bob said, uh, we have to remember, and Howard probably does remember, that one of Freud's early papers written in 1895 was the Project for Scientific Psychology. And if you read that paper very carefully, he is essentially predicting the discovery of the synapse for which Sherrington, 25 years later, yeah. won a Nobel Prize. It's the most extraordinary thing in the world. He was a neuroscientist. Yeah. He went into psychology because he was a Jew in Vienna mm -hmm. in the late 19th century and could not have an academic career. Who knows what he might have done as a scientist, a neuroscientist, <coughs> a neuropharmacologist, whatever. But I, I shouldn't have, and I have just about never had, the temerity to disagree with Tom Duffy, but I will. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, is, this, is <laughs> this is a horse that I've been riding for some 20 years, and I think I'll take a little gallop just for the benefit of, of everybody who is kind enough to come today. I'll begin with an anecdote, and some people here have heard me tell this true story. About six months ago, uh, Mark Mercurio, who runs the medical school ethics course, asked me to meet with a large group of students on, on uh, death and dying. And as we waited outside the seminar room, which was still locked, one of the Yale third year students came up to me and said, Dr. Newland, are you still teaching or are you emeritus? <laughs> now there's more <laughs> I think the problem and, and uh, <laughs> I think the problem with teaching humanities in medicine is simply a matter of what the curriculum is like mm. uh, invariably or almost invariably the kinds of things we wish for occur in the first two years of medical school the kids get on the wards in third year and they become like Spitfire pilots. Uh, they just want to shoot down disease and uh, bury it rather than bury their patients. They become fascinated by, why, what, by something that I've called the riddle of diagnosis and, and the riddle of therapy. Uh, that stands in the way of training humanistic physicians. When a young man or a young woman says to me, I've got six weeks or three weeks free, I'm going to trail a pediatrician, they, oh the word is shadow, I'm going to shadow a pediatrician, I always say don't, go home, hang around your mother, <laughs> hang around your pastor, hang around the person who created the idealistic young woman or young man who wants to go into medicine, don't waste your time during the summer, sitting in the laboratory, writing yet another paper. Yeah. Yeah. Northwestern uh, has created, uh, under the direction of a wonderful humanist, uh, Catherine Montgomery, a mm. department of humanities and medicine where students will study humanities through <coughs> four years, and she's trying to extend it, or will try to extend it, at the house, to the house staff level. That's where it really belongs, and I think only then will these very, very important efforts really become successful. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. I, uh, I read a, a story in the New York Times on the weekend, on Sunday, I think, 
about an effort at the little neighboring university down the way here, Fairfield University, where the faculty in a number of different departments have uh, endeavored, are endeavoring to teach ethics by presenting a play mm -hmm. in which the faculty are playing roles. And they chose Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Mm -hmm. um, and the students just go to the play as if, the, and then discussions are brought up in class. One student said, I couldn't believe my ethics professor up on the stage swearing. <laughs> but mm -hmm. the point is that the students see a dramatic presentation of, a, of an ethical problem in business, but in, in human interrelationships, and it's <coughs> their faculty are doing it as drama, not as, as a lectureship. So, um, I, 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 any other questions? I think, it, yes. Okay, um, thank you for such a lovely and thoughtful lecture. I'm thank a you. huge proponent of the humanities in medicine and science, and so your talk was certainly very welcome. And my question sort of touches on a few of the other points that have been raised um, in this discussion. And I was wondering what suggestions you have for bringing the humanities into medicine and science and also for, I guess, making it stick through residency and into the yeah. actual practice of medicine as well. I wish I could answer <laughs> that. I really do. I mean, it, 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 I don't know. Uh, well, I can make a suggestion. Yes, in some ways, and I come from the humanities side of things. In some ways, you could make the utilitarian point that both medicine and the humanities are, in the first instance, about the question of interpretation. Yes. And you have to understand uh, uh, a body, read a body, to use a humanistic metaphor, or a mind, uh, before you can treat it. And so uh, the kinds of things that one learns in the humanities can make you a, a better reader of the Bible. Oh, I think that uh, I agree and with that. And I, but I, if I were to start out an answer to that very expansive and <laughs> difficult question, I'd say it's probably by learning medicine at the side of people like Dr. Newland and Dr. Duffy, and but I would disagree with that. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't have. I, I, I read people's bodies. I do it for a living. But I came to it from the perspective of being meticulously and obsessively trained as a physician, mm -hmm. not as a human. So my skills and how I look at a patient's body have been shaped completely. Now, it's not saying that I exclude any humanities as a backdrop, but my ability to diagnose, looking in people's eyes, feeling their spleen, so forth and so on, that's medical training. I'll bet and that's true. I mean, I, I know it's true, but I'll bet you occasionally make the background of the case bigger. Oh, and that's, that's something very different. But the reading of the body is a medical skill. And I think we shouldn't go overboard in terms of when patients come to see physicians, they are looking to be diagnosed and to be cured. Yes, they're looking to be taken care of. And I would take that as the ubiquitous factor, the omnipresent factor. Absolutely. Yeah. But we shouldn't disparage where the skills of an excellent physician must remain that the humanities are important and it will embellish and amplify. Uh, but I think that there is a core which, which is absolutely essential. And I, I, yeah. I think, uh, l let me say yeah. one thing perhaps too much. Mm -hmm. I think we're taking our students to the museums now to look at paintings. And in the process, they're educating their eyes. There are some of us who believe that perhaps if they spent that same amount of time at the bedside, with somebody pointing out those features, that their eyes should be educated in the same or better fashion. Well, uh, no one would hire a deconstructionist for a doctor, <laughs> that's for sure, <laughs> because that's the case. <laughs>
uh, although in the medieval, there's a, there are medieval textbooks which say the doctor should always tell the patient they're going to die because if they die, you'll be treated as a great diagnostician. If they don't, you'll get credit for curing. I always ask the doctor before I allow them to examine my body what they read. We are fortunate this afternoon to have with us uh, Mr. Rich Frankie, who after many, many years of directing the Chicago Humanities Festival has come here to live and he's a great Yale alum and is charged by President Levin with creating a program to bring together throughout the university the sciences and the humanities. And I wonder if we can ask Rich to say a few words. Well, I'd be delighted to say a few words. First, I have to say I am, I am greatly honored and greatly pleased to hear this discussion that has taken place. It's very heartening <coughs> to, to hear that there are so many ways to, to get at the common uh, cause that we all have, which is to bring the sciences and the humanities together. I uh, was a history major at Yale, a businessman for 41 years in Chicago, and as an avocation in those 41 years was an advocate for the humanities and the public humanities. and. In 1985, I went on the Illinois Humanities Council, and in 1990, we started something called the Chicago Humanities Festival. And that festival was the result of what I learned and what, what stimulated me from my time at Yale. Uh, and it, 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 it was the, the issue of seeing how a society functions and how uh, we have such difficulty in communicating with each other within a large city, a city of three or five million people, Chicago, and how we can bring the humanities to the public. And the public humanities was, was my task so we started this festival. And the festival uh, was the backdrop <coughs> for the education of me in how then do, does science fit into our discussion when we're talking about the humanities in an urban setting. And what I progressively learned was that there was some, there, there, first of all, there was a, there, there, there was a difference between those who advocated the humanities and those who were advocating the sciences. Mm -hmm. Their vocabularies were different. I went on the board of the University of Chicago and the corporation at Yale the same year in 1985 and served for 12 years here and I still serve on the University of Chicago board. So. Uh, Watching these two universities and how they deliver the humanities and what was taking place, I, I saw a progression of this linear and a construction of silos of knowledge that, that got more specific, specific and were having difficulty speaking within their own units to each other. Scientists having difficulty, astrophysicists having difficulty talking to biologists or caring what <coughs> biologists were talking about. But even within the, the humanities, the, the difficulty that, that the English prof professors and students and the history uh, departments were having. So this specialization this narrowing of what we were turning out as graduate students bothered me. That we weren't turning out people who are broadly educated, they're narrowly educated. And what can we do about that? So uh, 
being not knowledgeable enough to say that this is a difficult task to take on, I thought, why don't I take this on? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I came back to uh, uh, President Levin because he and I, I, I served on the search committee that selected him. So we have a long-standing relationship. So I said, what we need at Yale is a, uh, a, a place where scientists and humanists can come together and they can take their two disciplines, bring them together, bring first-rate scholars and docs, postdocs, students, uh, and faculty where they have an, extent, uh, uh, an opportunity to look at each other's work as, as deviant and as different as it might be and find common areas of, of agreement and also areas of, of, uh, of discovery that, that will bring new vitality to what takes place in the university. And uh, so we have at the Whitney Humanities Center on November uh, second and third, uh, uh, first and second, the first first programs coming from this center where the sciences and the humanities are coming together. So it's it's been it's in place. It's ready to go. And uh, I'm not here to give a, a sales pitch, but I, <laughs> but but I am a little proud. Of it. And uh, I just uh, maybe you didn't know that this was going to take place. But I, I can envision that this could be the beginnings of a, a new way to bring these two disciplines together on a broad level. And uh, Howard served on the committee that helped design what we're doing. And I had many discussions with Shep uh, as to how to go about this, uh, as well as many others. In, in our community here. So it's, it's very exciting. I think it's good for, the ed, good for Yale. I think it's, it, it's good for uh, uh, the way we look at how we train the people that are going to be called educated and graduates of our institution. So that's what I've been about. Thank you for that opportunity. Yeah. Before we get ourselves too self-satisfied about our own privileged uh, <laughs> sort of Gnostic view of the, the virtues of humanities. Uh, I could give you a different view. I, I'm probably amongst the physicians and medical people who are having the most high-tech kind of practice. And I think that the distinction has something of a false dichotomy. And that the narrativity that we get out of humanities, and it's an important narrativity, is also part of the narrativity of, of technical communication. And the analysis, the analytic view that we get from philosophy and literature is also part of the scientific world. And the compassion that we should, that we must, that we ought to feel to our patients uh, needs to pass what the computer scientists would call a Turing test and even if it isn't human, it should seem human. <laughs> and the technical side that, uh, of being able to feel the spleen or identify the abnormality in a chest x-ray is critically important to all our patients because that's often sort of the reason why they've come to us. And those exist, these components and more, exist in, in both the domain that we call humanities and the domain that we call science. Now certainly there are subdomains that do not overlap and the astrophysicist and the biologist may not speak to each other on an everyday basis. But within medicine, the dichotomy is, is, is stretched in that people who are doing it, as Dr. Duffy said, are doing all of it and they learn it from all, all sides and we can teach it in subsections but we practice it as a unity and to split it up feels to me a little bit false although I certainly find parts of it more entertaining than others. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm afraid we're going to have time for one more question so... This is a hand but that's going to... Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of the comments have, have been about uh, the, the virtues of humanities to develop thought, the, vir you know, the skills that you learn in, in medicine. But I think one 
area that can tie all this together is to remember that our students are people and they have emotions and they're processing incredible experiences. The experience of dissecting a human body to the uh, 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 difficulty of amassing this huge you know, 35,000 word vocabulary and thinking how do you use that vocabulary to things they see on the floors uh, that are very troubling. There is a need and desire among our students to process that information and through their expression through art, through their expression through writing, informed by great literature. So that emotional aspect, processing the emotions becomes, in my way, a, a, a central place in medical education where we can tie all of these things together. And I think that's a lot of what Tom's program is about. And, and there are many little programs about under this bigger rubric, but I think this is something that should be built on giving students the time and the space to process their own experiences. Uh, it would be my suggestion. Yes. Thank you. Can I um, say before we... Uh, oh, okay. Well, I'm, I conclude by saying how... Well, I, it's interesting to have this conversation here and that the, this program is beginning to grow here. I think, I may not be correct here, but I think it was not until about 1900 that students at the college who took courses at the Sheffield Scientific School were given credit for their classes there. It was not considered to be appropriate to take those scientific courses. So we've got a little good to have the conversation still going. Um, it's it's a, been a great privilege for me to initiate this series. And I'm sure after this, there'll be a lot of people that say much better things than I do. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> before, before we thank, formally, before we thank Dr. Johnson formally, I just wanted to say that we have something else to be very thankful for, and that is that this is Dr. Johnson's last formal talk. Is that correct, that you're giving? Mm -hmm. I intended public. to be. Yes, and so <laughs> yeah. we are grateful to be recipients on such a, a, a wonderful... Oh, uh, invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. <laughs>